Hi, everybody. I'm Sharon Waxman. I'm the CEO and the Editor-in-Chief of The Wrap. I'm so happy to have you with us for our 2021-2022 awards screening of Not Going Quietly, a documentary that we're pleased to have the executive producer here with us, Brad Whitford, the director, Nicholas Bruckman, and the producer, Amanda Rowdy. Not Going Quietly is about the healthcare activist, Adi Barkhan. It has received three IDA nominations for Best Director, Best Documentary Feature, and Best Writing. And there's so much to talk about with this beautiful and moving film about Adi. <clears throat> we're going to be showing you the trailer and then we'll go into a conversation with our guests. To our audience, you can participate in the live chat of the stream. Give us your thoughts about the film. Tell us where you're coming from and what, uh, how the film makes you feel. Um, all right, here we go. Let's watch the trailer. Now, I want to have a chance to tell the story about my friend, Addie Barkin. He's been an activist and an organizer all of his life. With us today is Adi Barkin. I can't do Adi's story justice. I will let him tell it. After Carl was born, we felt like we had reached the mountaintop. Say hi. And then, out of the clear blue sky, we were struck by lightning. I was diagnosed with ALS today. The knowledge that I was dying was terrible, but dealing with my insurance company was even worse. I wanted to spend every moment I had left with Rachel and Carl, but then Congress came after our health care. I couldn't stay quiet any longer. My next guest made headlines when he confronted a Republican senator on an airplane. This is your moment to be American hero. All right, ready to rumble. We decided to start a movement. To urge people to stand up, confront the elected officials. All right, I'm gonna knock on your door. Did you just get out of jail? Are you gonna keep protesting on Monday? Yeah. What do we want? Healthcare! I am willing to give my last breath to save our democracy. No, no, no. What are you willing? Thank you. Liz, I'm having trouble breathing. I just think we have to stop. Our time on this earth is the most precious resource we have. <laughs> Movement building allows me to transcend my body. And that's the beauty of democracy, that together we can be more than our individual selves. The paradox of my situation is, the weaker I get, the louder I become. Welcome, Amanda, Nicholas, and Bradley. <clears throat> I will try not to cry during that trailer. I'm sure uh, it hits you guys, maybe not with the same force because you've seen it a million times, but the story of Adi Barkhan is so remarkable. It's almost hard to believe that it's real life and not some made up fiction that somebody who was this extremely gifted young man, a lawyer who went to Columbia and then Yale, which you guys, by the way, don't emphasize anywhere in the film, but I looked it up. <clears throat> so he's he's a, he's a one of the elites. Too bad. An extraordinary person who pursued activism and then was struck down with ALS at the age of 33 with a young child and a young wife and his whole life ahead of him. And instead of giving up, did the opposite. So I don't mind who, tell me how you guys got involved in this project. What was the genesis of it? I, I usually do this one, so I'm happy to All right. stay in that. Thank you, Nicholas. Range. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for having us. Um, it's really an honor to talk to you and I'm glad you were moved by the film. Um, I met Adi in 2018. Um, not to do a documentary, but to make a short launch video for his healthcare organization, Be a Hero. And I got a call from Liz Jaff, who is a mutual friend of mine who had worked on the Obama campaign. And I 
done for throughout my career political ads of different kinds and she said i just met this guy on a plane it was this crazy situation we confronted a senator together the video went viral and i saw this video and was just totally blown away it was the one of the you know most powerful and everybody was it was kind of the most powerful piece of political theater of the entire year it was a moment of hope during a very very dark time um, at the beginning of the trump administration and it was being led by somebody who you wouldn't think such a strong source of hope would come from and so very very quickly that 90 second launch video for his be a hero organization became an independent film um, that would be feature length and tell his story in a long form and journalistic and observational way it was um, because, of the, vi- very because of the video you, you decided to do a film because of the jeff flake video well when i met adi um to do a short commercial uh again that's mm-hmm. what i thought it would be mm-hmm. you see this moment in the film he's topless uh bare chested um in his wheelchair and he says all right let's get started and that moment to me was really transformative because it was indicative of how adi was his resilience to not only his disease but to the situation that was happening politically and and the humor with which i knew made him somebody that you'd want to spend 90 minutes with or in mm-hmm. amanda in my case uh, three years making yeah. this film right, um, and that right. was really the beginning of the genesis of, of talking to adi about doing something longer form and and the urgency of it sharon was that adi was already losing his voice from the time mm-hmm. we met him Adi mm-hmm. had about six months left to speak. And mm-hmm. we knew that that would be the core of the film is watching his voice decrease, but him gain this national platform and that that incredibly poignant irony of him losing his voice and then giving it to so many others. Mm. Well, Brad, you're very involved in a lot of political uh, causes. And you may remember we met back on the set of West Wing a bazillion years ago, but of course, I watch many, many of the things that you get involved in. How and, and why did you get involved in this film? Well, I, I, I think I met him before you guys. I, I, I knew Adi. Adi was sort of famous in progressive circles uh, for not just being a firebrand, but for being an effective uh, tactician. And um, he had done some work uh, on reforming the Federal Reserve, uh, fighting uh, to make sure that there were not only representatives of rich banks, but um, uh, because it dictates so much of the economy, um, uh, unemployed people, low wage people. And it was a sort of brilliant idea that I had heard about. And then I met him doing uh, we were doing an action at Senator Feinstein's office um, for the Dreamers, and he was a striking uh, soul, the definition of a happy warrior. I met him in a Starbucks across the street from there. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was losing his voice. I didn't know what was wrong with him. I didn't know if he'd had a stroke or I, I, I didn't know. And there were these counter protesters who actually had swastikas. They were sort of uh, anti-immigrant, you know, kind of scary people sort of blocking our way. And Adi, who uh, was kind of struggling with his voice at that point, said, uh, put the guy with ALS in front, make him hit the guy with ALS. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> it'll, be, it'll be great publicity. So I fell in love with him uh, no. immediately. And then um, I was talking to him and he mentioned that Nick and Amanda um, were documenting him. And I I just felt like this is uh, a a story I wanna do anything to get told. And Mm -hmm. I don't have all of those skills. My dear friends, the Duplass brothers, uh, had recently had a huge success in the documentary world. And I trust them like family. Um, And I knew they could could help us, um, you know, guide us, but, uh, uh, this film works on so, uh, so many levels. It, yeah. it, it, it erases, and it's a very important thing to do. It erases, uh, uh, the separation, the artificial separation between the personal and the political. Um, it's, it's, it's a story of incredible, uh, the necessity, the need for hope, uh, that, um, Adi embodies this disease did not 
define him. It actually revealed him. And especially in these difficult political times, this voice and Adi, you know, Adi's organization is not called I'm a hero. It's called be a hero. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. He's not scolding Jeff Flake the way I would in a very unconstructive <laughs> way. <laughs> he's saying be exactly. A no, no. Uh, he invites him to a conversation. He, and he invites voices uh, mm -hmm. in. I think very, very important. And he was very successful it, it put at, at, at putting, using his body to put himself at the center of the ridiculous um, uh, circumstance we live in in this country that uh, we don't all have access to health care. It's, it's insane. It actually flipped, I think, his work, um, that a lot of which you see on this trip, uh, really helped uh, flip the house and we would be in a terrible state if that happened. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no no doubt the way you uh, follow him across the country uh, and tell that narrative. So just for our viewers who, just to remind you if you've seen the film or if you haven't yet seen the film, um, the, the crew <laughs> who are making the movie follow Adi across the country in a trailer uh, where he's taking his message on the road to a whole series of, I guess, um, states where the question of uh, the 2018 midterm election is on the fence, on the bubble, and they're, they're trying to help, Demo he's trying to help Democratic candidates <clears throat> using, using healthcare as the tip of the spear, which everybody said in 2018 was the issue. And um, it's remarkable. So Amanda and Nichols, when you're going on that journey, well, Nichols, obviously you were there. Amanda, were you there present for, for much of this as well? Yeah. So, yeah. So tell us what that was like and um, what surprises revealed themselves along the way in that journey. Yeah, I think, one of the things that I often mention is that we could have never anticipated where this film was going and what happened. And it was mm -hmm. such a wild and exciting ride. And it really made me so hopeful too, because we did just think that this film would be about this road trip across the country where Audie's fighting to flip the house for the midterm elections. And we thought that was plenty of material and a very compelling story for a feature film. Right. But then he just kept on going and then we had to keep on going. And so, you know, he fought Kavanaugh and then he went and he testified in front of the House for Medicare for All, which is the first time someone had ever done that with eye gaze technology. Um, and then after that, all the Democratic presidential candidates or most of them sat down with them to have hour long interviews about health care. So it was a really crazy time because I think, you know, we set out to make one film and then we really had to kind of learn and adapt from our subject and evolve with him as he continued to, you know, create this movement alongside Liz. Um, and that was that was really amazing, but also challenging too as filmmakers because you know, we were tired <laughs> after the road trip, but then um, mm -hmm. we didn't really have an excuse because he just kept going. Um, and that was pretty incredible. And I think it forced us to grow as storytellers too. And we really learned from him when he was approaching different representatives and bringing other people to, um, you know, use their stories as a tool for change. Um, that kind of compelled us to center them also in the road trip story, because that was such an important part of mm -hmm. the trip itself. That was kind of the driving force was other people's stories and accounts and experiences with um, these policies. Yeah, I mean, one of the many interesting things about the film is you actually show how political activists work and how they train to um, be effective. So to somebody like Adi, it probably comes naturally a lot. Or somebody like um, Liz, who was his wing woman, so to speak, um, and just has a real, really great instinct for social media and video and what's going what's gonna to play. It was super interesting watching how they prepped that Jeff Flake moment on the plane. Um, you know, it, there's video on there that we didn't see. Those of us, you know, who all saw the viral video of them prepping it and testing it and making sure and sort of gaming it out. So I think that's, that's really interesting in terms of how to be effective. And, and you keep coming back to these personal stories, looking someone in the eye, holding onto their hand, making them see you as a person. Um, you know, that, that I thought was fascinating. 
The other thing I want to point out, which was not really in the film, but without her, none of this works, which is Adi's wife. Yeah. Who's this incredible, incredible person who is waiting back at home, losing every day with her husband and her child with her husband so that he can go and essentially try to change the world. Um, her name is, is it? Rachel. 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> She's a doctor. And I mean, that just takes, I know the movie's about him, but I had just have to call that out. Like what kind of bravery does that take? Uh, yeah. uh, her, her strength and, and uh, her, empathy and and her understanding that this is not um uh nicholas and i were, we were talking earlier uh when you have children um your political engagement uh you're seeing your children's future being attacked and you're realizing that you need to do everything you can uh especially in a democracy to shape the, uh, the world that they will live in. And I think Rachel in a, in a very difficult but beautiful way understands this impulse of Adi. Again, it's not, um, uh, it, 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 it's, it's about tactically uh, uh, making the country a better place and it's very connected to his, uh, his love for Carl. And, and and for his love for his family. And I think she understands that. Yeah, but it's so out of the ordinary, I Incredible. think is what I'm saying, is when, yes, is. you know, every human instinct is to, you know, circle the wagons and protect what you have left rather than gamble everything on uh, an uncharted course or an uncertain outcome that benefits a lot of other people and was really not going to benefit you. I, I always say this, and I think Adi hates it, but you know, it is extremely rare when someone uses their own unspeakable suffering to alleviate it in others. Yes, that's yeah. kind of what they, you know, design religions around. And Adi's point is no. <laughs> that's right. Adi's no. point is no. We all have this capacity, uh, um, and. Uh, finds a way to judo this horror into, uh, you know, to weaponize it as, as a message delivery system about democracy and about the specific issues he's fighting for, which is the reason he's not here today, because he's been fighting, you know, he doesn't have time. For, <laughs> he, doesn't have time. he doesn't have time to promote a movie for he the award season. He doesn't have time to promote a movie. Oh my gosh. There's a uh, healthcare um, uh, fights to be had. That's really, yeah, uh, that, that's Adi, funny. Adi and his team are still, just to expand on Bradley, Adi and his team have been incredibly influential in the movement to get home and community-based services funding included in the infrastructure bill, which mm -hmm. is to provide hundreds of billions of dollars, an unprecedented amount, to provide funding for home caregivers like the ones you see in the film that keep Adi in his home. Mm -hmm. And that fight came to a, a successful uh, midpoint last night when uh, the when the when the house passed to voted to pass um 150 billion dollars in funding um and of course all of this is a short step on the way to medicare for all but i think thanks to the work that adi and others have done in the film there's now this huge groundswell of support for that um and so yeah we let adi <laughs> fight those good fights but we will um we have done many screenings with him and i i will just mention um when adi came out to the la screening um, it was just this rapturous moment where he got that standing ovation that we'd promised him four years ago when we started this film. Mm -hmm. And it was a really beautiful moment to be able to experience that with him. And, and he's been really um, a great part of the journey of, of promoting and spreading the word about the movie. So let's explain a little bit more about ALS because we, we watch him uh, deteriorate where he can no longer walk and he's in a wheelchair. Um, eventually he can no longer speak tragically and he's using this um, eye movement software, which is unbelievable, to, mm -hmm. um, to voice his thoughts. But his, his mental acuity seems like unchanged. Perfect. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Is that, I mean, so what is, 
Is it just the body just kind of gives it's, up on you? Specifically attacks the, uh, the muscles and tragically and wonderfully leaves the mind um, untouched. Adi is as sharp and as uh, loving uh, and as and dark funny. Funny yes. as, uh, uh, as he ever was. But yes, it's a very bizarre thing. And, and uh, I, I, I want to say two things. I, first of all, I, I, I've spent my life around a lot of amazing storytellers and the mm -hmm. fear with something about uh, you want to do justice to Adi and I am so grateful to Amanda and to Nicholas because this was where, you know, we're constantly wondering where the story is going, is going to end. Um, uh, the danger of dipping into sentimentality mm -hmm. or hero worship, mm -hmm. uh, all of that. It was a very sophisticated, wonderful uh, a, a piece of storytelling, which I'm so grateful does justice to this guy who we all um, uh, love. But um, I, I, I just want to acknowledge that. That's why this, um, that's why the film is getting so much attention because the, the story is powerfully told and stories uh, are very, very important and very, very powerful. So I'm just grateful to them. Thank you, Bradley. I mean, one Bradley thing I want to say about that the, is just the, sorry. I was going to say Bradley was there being a guiding light for us in a lot of moments of despair and worry and anxiety for us. And he was just like, it'll all come together. Don't worry. And what, what, was, the, was, what was the despair over? I, I, no, a lot given, of what, given, I mean, there's a lot of places it could come from, but yeah, I mean, I, specifically as a filmmaker, I would say. Yeah. Oh, I think Bradley touched on a lot of it, you know, I, this guy is just so incredible and I think has changed all of our lives in some probably major way. And, you know, he's giving you some of the most precious time that he has left and you, you want to make sure that you do it right and that you do him justice and you have a piece that his kids can look back on and be proud of the way that it was told. Um, so that was, that was hard. And, you know, we wanted to get the balance right of, you know, portraying him as a real person, not just, you know, Hagiography, and we wanted to show that like he struggles too, and but not go too far into you know the tragedies, so that people will still come along for the ride and experience some of the lightness that he brings to the story as well. So really striking a balance between you know the darkness and the lightness, and also proving a point that you know it's worth it to fight for a democracy. It's something that can be really energizing, energizing and engaging, and that's a that was a big challenge too, especially in the political climate that we were in when we were making the film because people weren't super into watching political films for good yeah, reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, and there was this constantly moving, um, I mean, I, it was interesting for me, um, uh, the Duplass brothers were like uh, kind of, you know, middle school football coaches. They're like, what's the beginning, <laughs> what's the middle, <laughs> what's the end, oh, really? where, cool. where, where are you going? And uh, you don't, you know, again, like a middle school football coach, it was like a, you know, champions adjust situation. Like, how was this election going to turn out? Mm -hmm. How, uh, uh, what personal decisions was Adi going to make? Should we wait and go longer? Um, uh, you know. Uh, well, I, mean, I, I, have, I have a question in terms of like, when you talk about despair, I, I have to think that as the producers and the director, you're asking yourself as you go through this, because of course he wants to be there for the film also, whether anything you're doing is pushing him into a, into a high risk or, yeah. you know, weakening him or shortening his life, frankly, in any way. I mean, That's how do you lot. even gauge that? Uh, Adi was usually the one pushing us and everyone else to go harder. You know, he was I saying see. one more event, one more rally, let's let's go and cruising at 11 miles an hour in his chair with us following him. But there there were some really thorny ethical questions in making the film that mm -hmm. I think you're alluding to. And the biggest one was was his voice, which was that 
ah, uh, do you see him lose his voice? Literally, like t- permanently lose his voice. There was there was a number on the number of words he had left to say. Mm-hmm. And of course, as a filmmaker, at every possible moment on the road with him, I wanted to say, you know, what did we do those on the fly interviews that all of us documentary filmmakers do? Where do we just go? How are you feeling right now? What's next? And to do that would have really meant Adi not being able to give the next speech or maybe running out of voice on a call with Carl and his wife. And so we had to refrain from interviewing him for weeks at a time, which you can imagine is so painful with somebody Mm -hmm. as your subject that you want to hear every single thing they have to say before it's too late. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there were so many times, oh, should we squeeze in a word now? And then we would decide not to. And what's interesting is that that ultimately, I think, made the film stronger because it forced us to take this very cinema verite narrative where every emotion that Adi experiences, we tried to really have it in relation to other people, to the activists he meets on the road, to his wife, to his son, with Liz, with Tracy and Nate. And it, I think, creates a very narrative framework for the film, but it wasn't something that we knew when we were making it would work. And that's why we use this kind of artful construction of Adi's voice machine bookending the story, even the part of his life when he had a voice to speak with. Mm -hmm. We chose to use his current voice, partly because it was the only tool available to us. We actually interviewed Adi over Google Docs and then generated the audio ourselves to save him the time and the breath using his software that we replicated at home. But just rather than using the eye software, he would type it and then Google will generate it as a voice. Got it. Mm But just to be just to be clear, uh, this is not a situation of oh we have an activist who has ALS and a couple of documentarians go and go why don't we go on a road trip? This and this isn't Liz Jaff, uh, who is a force of fucking nature herself, mm-hmm. saying come on you got to get out of the house and do it. This is Adi going, uh, I need we need to do this. I can use this. Uh, this will not define me. This will reveal me, and I can use it effectively to help other, uh, to help other, uh, other people. I mean, if, if, push that energy. Have you guys ever talked with him? I'm sure you have <clears throat> about what would have been his path had he not gotten sick. Yeah, I think he talks a lot about how he would have loved to have had a career as a politician at some point. Yeah. I think he would have made a great progressive politician and he's someone who uh, is very thoughtful and, you know, takes note of everyone who's talking to in a room, writes down their name, makes sure he knows it, um, mm-hmm. you know, writes down notes about what they talked about. Um, he's just a very thoughtful person and someone who really cares about other people. So, um, yeah, yeah, his manner that, is reminiscent of, you know, the squad, you know, in, in many ways. <laughs> Not just his politics, but his approach. Yeah, uh, he he's also strangely. Um, th- uh, there is. Uh, I I sometimes get to the uh, the part that is not strategic, that just dri- uh, drives him nuts. But he is incredibly strategic. Um, mm-hmm. in, in his thinking and he understands it goes to something i really believe it's very easy to be cynical about politics and to be frustrated and we should be but politics is the way we create our moral vision it actually is a, a will and grace won't help you if you have a pre-existing condition culture is fantastic but part of the reason i think we have minority rule in this country is that we don't do the follow through politically. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think people, uh, I think people like Adi understand that, that you have to pass uh, a bill in order to get home healthcare workers and community healthcare workers to improve the lives of people. You can't just scream at how much you hate uh, uh, the the people who frustrate you. Yeah. (laughs) I don't. I don't think we actually have minority rule, but I take fully take your point because I think we are in grave danger of living under minority rule <laughs> as of maybe the next election. But um, uh, well, how is Adi today? He he. Uh, I'll say it because we've provided the screening link for our viewers so they can see it, that he did have to finally take this step of getting a tracheotomy, which um, 
removes all ability to speak, but it also is a choice to uh, live on, which uh, I think not every person, given that the quality of life uh, that you're faced with with ALS, would choose necessarily. Um, can what is his what is his state of his health and like? Because initially they said he could live three or four years, but that was more than three or four years ago. Yeah, I can speak a little to that. I mean, I, yeah. I will say I spoke to Adi's uh, assistant, Carmen, this morning, and she said he's great. And, and Bradley has said this before, which I really appreciate, that people often say, well, how's Adi? Is he okay? Um, you know, they're worried about him. And on a fundamental level, like, Adi is doing very, very well in the sense that mm -hmm. he's watching his children grow up. He has a beautiful wife that he loves. He's going to see Bradley's show uh, in Scrooge in a, in a few weeks and enjoy it along with, along with everybody else. And beyond all of that, he has more purpose and meaning in his life than most of us have in our fingernails, you know, that are able to, in his fingernails, sure. most of us have mm -hmm. in our mm -hmm. lives. And, and I think he feels that. And I think that's one of the messages of the film that makes it so hopeful is this idea that Adi says that that hope is a state of action, not it's not just a it's not a feeling. And Adi's acting every day. The Be a Hero campaign is very active. It was really influential in winning um, that mm -hmm. home care based service, as I mentioned earlier. He's very active on Twitter. And of course we want folks who watch the film to join the greater fight for Medicare for all, but you can get involved in Adi's fight right now. You can be part of the Be a Hero movement. Adi's still bird dogging senators, but he's doing it on Twitter where he has a very active platform. And it's amazing to think that, you know, the most powerful activist in America, talking to Kamala Harris and, and Bernie Sanders and Jeff Flake and influencing the White House right now was doing all of that with his eyeballs on Twitter. The Just only completely Biden. amazing. Well, you also show him talking to President Biden mm -hmm. in, in the film. So the president knows him. Or yes. Oh, uh, yes. It gave him a gave him enough time to. This this is not just some uh, like uh, uh, you know obscure, yeah, you know, right. hearted. This is I, I think Politico. I think Nancy Pelosi has said this is the most effective yes. political activist mm -hmm. um, in the country, and uh, to a certain extent, um, for a lot of reasons, politicians are windmills. And uh, we make them climb a filthy rope and they get down to the bottom and we say your hands are dirty. Um, but they have to operate in this arena. And the truth is they're kind of windmills and you got to change the wind. And that's what we can do. And that's mm -hmm. uh, 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 that's what, um, you know, you know, that's what Audie focuses on. And again, he wrote uh, a piece in The New York Times recently. Uh, you know, not only is he okay, he's happy. I saw him recently in, in in Santa Barbara, and he's taking such joy in in. Uh, he never thought he would be able to take his son to his first basketball practice. He is happy. There is there is real joy. Um, and so, uh, so now he has a, a life expectancy that is. Uh, yeah, he could live another 10, 20, 30 years. It, you Good. know, everyone's ALS affects them differently and there's there's no predicting the future, but um, kind of getting at what right. these guys are saying, um, Rachel told me earlier in the process that it would surprise a lot of people, but you can actually have a pretty high quality of life um, once you're on a ventilator and you have 24 seven care and that care is really the key there because it enables him to be a dad and enables Rachel to be a professor and a mom um, and a wife, you know, they are able to have their relationships and to have another child because all of that stress has been alleviated, which is so huge and they can be a family. And, again, and is that family. covered by insurance or is uh, well, part of it is part, part of it is yeah. part of it is. And that's what he's fighting for other people, right. uh, for other people to have people. And he acknowledges that, because of his position as a political activist, he had access to people who, you know, who could help him out. So many people with ALS do not choose to get a ventilator because they will not be able to be in their home um, uh, to, uh, uh, to be connected to their families with, you know, without uh, that kind of support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there's a scene where he's, <laughs> facing down this poor insurance adjuster. I don't really mean this poor insurance adjuster, but still, you know, who has to 
answer to him, it's fantastic. Yeah. Sorry, Nicholas, you're going to say something. I think you're. Yeah, just to say that it's a it's a global issue. I'm in Germany right now, where we're showing the Uh, film tomorrow night, and it's been you know very well received internationally. Because even in countries that have sane healthcare systems, where we've shown Mm -hmm. the film, like Canada and Korea, there are still first of all activists that need to put pressure to win those fights. There's still issues of how much home care is covered. And so this this idea of keeping people in their homes and, and our society collectively taking care of the least of us, like Adi, and allowing them to be productive members of society is a global issue that folks are fighting for, even in more developed healthcare systems. Um, and the, tr- uh, the truth is, and I think Adi, uh, Adi mentions this, we are all going to face this. Yeah, we, right. We are all going to face this. I, I bring up the example in, in, in my life, my mother, who I was very close to, she lived a very long life, and then she had a stroke. And at that point, uh, she needed 24-hour care, even if she was um, uh, in a nursing home. I am one of five children. All of my brothers and sisters work, only because I, you know, bumped into Aaron Sorkin and had you know, a financial horseshoe hanging out of my ass, was I able to live, uh, give my mother these wonderful two years of life with, you know, with my kids and real happiness. And everyone is going to face this, Hmm. which is, which is why I think this, this issue is so important, not only for the ALS community, but all of us, Trust me, you're going to face it. No, I, I, I'm, I'm dealing with it with my aging parents and yeah. all my peers are dealing with it one way or the other. And especially in the COVID situation, yeah. so many people have either, you know, long haul consequences that are not as debilitating but as ALS. But it, it's, it's amazing what a coalition of different kinds of people, and you see it in the film, that healthcare brings together is because it, touches every single kind of person, tall, yeah. fat, skin, you know, skinny, <laughs> black, white, right wing, left wing. And it, um, it is, it is so fundamental. So, um, well, thank you so much, um, Amanda Roddy, Brad Whitford and Nicholas Bruckman for joining me to talk about not going quietly. What a, what a beautiful tribute to Adi Barkin and what a great example of um, the human spirit. Thank you so much. much. Thank you, Sharon. Good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us today for the screening of Not Going Quietly. If you like our screenings and you like a screening series, you should take advantage of our free trial to Rap Pro, and then you can be the first to know about our upcoming events and our screenings. You can also register for those screenings or catch up on any past screenings you might have missed by visiting therap.com. Go to the screenings tab in the main nav bar. And we'll see you next time.